welcome to Zoonosis with Joy. On this channel, I like to talk about animals, health, and society. Today we'll be talking about the Bone Overcastle dog. It's one of the earliest dogs in human history, and I think it sheds a lot of light on the origins of dogs and the origins of the human-animal bond. Let's get started. So, to give you a little bit of background, we're going to talk about the origins of dogs first, and then kind of talk about this particular case. The origins of dogs are a little bit unclear. We know that they were domesticated from grey wolves and in Eurasia sometime around 14,000 years ago. That would have been in the Upper Paleolithic um, during the Magdalenian. This would have been after Neanderthals went extinct and before agriculture really took root, so to speak. So this would have been a time when humans were hunter-gatherers, living in small communities and probably freely roaming in little territories, basically. With that, we're not 100% sure if there was a single domestication event, but there is some evidence that there might have been multiple domestication events during that time frame. One of the earliest dogs ever discovered is called the Bone Overcastle dog. I apologize for my German pronunciation. If there are any German listeners out there, you'll have to forgive me. Um, it was discovered during World War I in the German city of Bonn, and it was found in a rock quarry and it was found actually as a grave site. In this gravesite, there were two human individuals, an older male and a younger female. There was also a dog buried along with it, hence the bone over castle dog, and there was a number of grave goods. So including in these grave goods would have been a little statuette of a ruminant, they think maybe a deer. There was a deer incisor, uh, there was a baculum, and there's a few other things as well, including a little um, sewing needle as well as some red ochre pigment. Red ochre was a paint that was often used on cave walls as well as for human bodies as well to ornament them. The dog itself is quite interesting. So to kind of cover that, first let's talk about how old this dog was and the diseases that it had. This dog was estimated to have been about seven or eight months old. Now if we think about dogs, typically we say that they are um, full grown when they're about a year to 18 months. So this guy would have still been a puppy. We don't know if it was male or female, but we're pretty confident in the age based on the uh, presence of the growth plates and the stature of the dog itself as well. This dog had numerous pathologies, which means diseases, over its lifetime, and it really shows that this dog lived quite a hard life. From what we have, we have jaw fragments, um, we have bits of the legs, um, we have bits of the ribs and bits of the vertebrae. We can determine that it had suffered from several different diseases. Um, the right medial condyle of the radius, which is right there, this dog had a bone spur, an osteophyte. This would have been presence of osteoarthritis or degenerative joint disease. Now this dog had no evidence of any elbow dysplasia like our German Shepherds get today. In fact, this was probably due to trauma from getting hit in the leg, either with a club or a rock, it's hard to say for sure. But this dog probably would have walked with a visible limp and probably uh, would not have been a good chaser, a good hunter that way. We also know that it suffered probably a major viral infection, and there are a few lines of evidence that suggest this. And this mostly comes from the cranial uh, pathologies in the mouth. So we know that it had horizontal enamel hypoplasia, which is basically, you know, front to back, um, decreased production is hypoplasia, and enamel is just the stuff that covers the tooth, basically, that protects it from wear. This is a very classic sign of a disease called uh, canine distemper virus. Canine distemper virus is a morbillovirus, not a morbius virus, guys. It was a morbillovirus that is typically carried by raccoons in the New World. It's also carried by coyotes, foxes, and wolves, and, you know, feral dogs as well. So this virus is very infectious and spreads through the upper respiratory tract. They typically get an upper respiratory tract infection. They often cough and sneeze and have uh, conjunctivitis and conjunctivitis, con conjunctivitis and nasal discharge. And they spread it to one another that way. From there, it becomes a much more severe infection. And these guys often get what's called hard pad disease, which is thickening of the paw pads. And they also get what's called encephalitis. Encephalitis, as the name implies, is inflammation, itis, of the head, encephala. So this animal would have had brain swelling that would have caused seizures, could have caused coma, could have caused neurological deficits. And this animal probably was on the verge of death around three weeks after it was infected. 
Based on where the enamel hypoplasia line occurs, we can estimate that this animal caught this around five weeks old, or sorry, five months old, 21 weeks to be precise. So this animal caught it when it was about five months old and had lived to about seven or eight months based on the growth plates, which means that it had lived with a pretty severe viral infection for a long period of time. There are a few other things in the mouth which suggest that it had this sort of infection as well. It was missing the second and third premolars, which also suggests that this animal had um, suffered a major viral infection, which is often associated with the morbillivirus. It also had really bad periodontal disease. In adults and in animals, we often prevent that with toothbrushing and dental flossing. I hope you guys are brushing your teeth and flossing your teeth because that's disgusting if you don't. But with this one, it probably would have been to overwhelming viral infection causing immunosuppression, causing the bacteria in the mouth to start eating away at the tooth roots. Gross. It also had wear on the incisor, so it probably was chewing on things it shouldn't have been doing, which is pretty un uncommon for most modern dogs, especially at this age, except if they're like a collie and they chase tennis balls or something like that or chew on sticks. But this animal probably suffered a very hard life, but it had survived with all these major infections and the trauma to its leg and all probably other things as well. It probably would have required 24-hour um, care, especially around that three-week mark, so it would have need, you know, um, constantly being fed and watched and given water and taken care of, probably to the detriment of the people taking care of this animal. They expended a lot of resources to make sure that this animal survived. It's probably one of the earliest cases of veterinary care ever being done, although we didn't, they didn't have any of the modern medicines that we have now. They didn't have anti-inflammatories except, you know, plant-based ones. They didn't have any IV fluids. They definitely didn't have any hospitalization procedures that way. So what this probably meant is that they, these guys were constantly caring for these animals. They weren't hunting or gathering, and they were likely supported by uh, other people in their community so that they could spend time to take care of this animal. That does raise the question of why. Obviously, there would have been no material benefit to actually making sure this animal survived this massive infection and the leg injury. It probably would have been no good for hunting after this point. Probably wouldn't have been a very vicious guard dog. It would have been sickly and small and not able to move very fast. It didn't have a lot of meat on it, definitely, because it had an overwhelming viral infection and probably didn't have any lean body mass other than, you know, whatever few muscles it had remaining. And it probably didn't have a very good coat either. As you can imagine with the hard pack disease, it probably didn't have a very uh, lustrous coat or anything that make it worthwhile to actually take care of this animal. So we have to think of non-material um, reasons, immaterial reasons, why this animal would have uh, been cared for by this community. We could speculate on a few, but there's nothing really definitive, unfortunately. Definitely this would have required um, a high-ranking status member to actually take care of this animal or someone with high status to say, hey listen, we need to take care of this animal. It implies, of course, that there would have been chains of command within this community that um, they could pull resources together to actually care for an animal that probably had very little chance of survival. You could interpret this as a costly signal. So a costly signal is something like um, conspicuous consumption. I can smash this guitar because I'm so rich, I can buy another one. I can take care of this animal that's sick that will never actually feed me or protect me or hunt for me. This is a kind of thing that shows that you have clout, that you're a high-ranking status member in your community. It also could imply that this animal has spiritual significance. If this animal had spiritual significance, that would explain the grave goods at the site. It would have also explained the red ochre pigment. This is a highly valued animal, say like maybe it had preserved someone's life in any uh, altercation with like a bear or a cave lion, or I don't know if they had cave lions at that point, I'd have to look into it, but um, definitely it could have been that they were trying to repay this debt they owed to this dog. And this dog might have also been, you know, a good luck charm or saved off bad luck. So there definitely would have been some reason that they kept this animal around, but that sort of thing doesn't necessarily preserve in the archeological record. What we do know is that the human-animal bond did not arrive necessarily from a position of utilitarian good. It was not this animal was giving a lot more to the community than it was taking. It would have been a non-material benefits that the human beings got from it. Or it may have been no benefits. This may have been a relationship of uh, kinship where this animal is just being cared for by its community. That it needed um, help and people stepped forward to sacrifice for themselves and show that they uh, could, basically. But that does raise some interesting questions of why we keep animals in the first place. 
definitely Fido who lives in an apartment and doesn't ever see any wild animals and does nothing but eat scraps and play with um, sticks probably doesn't offer much in the way of benefits to the owners that they have. Maybe the people enjoy taking him on bucks. Maybe they, you know, like playing fetch with him. Maybe they just have a personal bond with this animal that has no material benefits whatsoever. This animal could hate their owners and the owners still find them funny anyway or find a special connection with them anyway. And I think we need to really account for these economic decisions in our modern animals too. That if we try to measure everything by the utilitarian good that an animal does for us, we're going to miss out on all the interesting relationships that we have that are non-material or non-economic. And um, that's kind of all the thoughts I have for today about this animal. Definitely if you have any thoughts or if you didn't like my interpretation of this case, definitely let me know. If you want to learn more about the uh, diseases I mentioned such as the morbola virus or osteoarthritis or periodontal disease, um, definitely ask me. Or if you have suggestions for future videos, I'd like to hear them in the comments as well. Thank you and have a good one. Peace.